Now, the official American response to September 11th was declared by George W. Bush. Bush gave a speech in which he declared a Bush doctrine. The Bush doctrine declared war on terrorism. Now, this is interesting because traditionally, when you declare war, you declare war on a nation state. But terrorists are not nation states. So declaring war on terrorism broadly is a, it's a very vague and sprawling enemy. And because of that, that meant that there's no clear timetable or point in which you can declare victory over terrorism. Bush also stated you are either with us or you are against us declaring that there was no room for other nations to critique American methods in this war on terror. And because we're not engaging in a war with another nation state, the rules of engagement, the rules of warfare are very murky. Traditionally, when you go to war since the late 1800s, Warfare is governed by rules called the Geneva Convention, which grant rights to prisoners of war and also restrict the use of torture. However, the United States argued that because terrorists were not official agents of another nation state, that the Geneva Convention did not apply. There's an increase in American military presence in uh, former Soviet republics located in Central Asia who had looser national guidelines about things like torture to fully take advantage of these loopholes in the rules of traditional warfare. Bush also accused a few nations of aiding or harboring terrorists and making weapons of mass destruction, by which he meant nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons, with chemical and biological weapons actually being banned by the Geneva Convention. Bush declared three nations to be an axis of evil, Iraq, Iran, and North Korea. None of these nations was linked to 9-11. There was no evidence whatsoever to suggest involvement in the terrorist attacks of 9-11. There was no history of cooperation between Iraq, Iran, and North Korea. In fact, Iraq and Iran hated each other and had been involved in a very nasty war in the 80s, which had actually seen the use of chemical weapons by Saddam Hussein. Um, nevertheless, though, those are the nations that Bush singled out as needing to be on notice in this war on terrorism. Now, to officially enact Bush's ideas of a war on terrorism, we issued the National Security Strategy in 2002 which declared that the United States would engage in preemptive war, that it was necessary for us to eliminate threats before further acts of terrorism could be carried out against the United States. According to the National Security Strategy, and I quote, to forestall or prevent such hostile acts by our adversaries, the United States will, if necessary, act preemptively in exercising our inherent right of self-defense. The United States will not resort to force in all cases to preempt emerging threats. Our preference is that non-military actions succeed, and no country should ever use preemption as a pretext for aggression. So if we engage in aggressive action first, they shouldn't use that as an excuse to be aggressive back to us is roughly how that translates. So after George W. Bush has declared war on terrorism, what is that going to look like? We now have declared that we don't consider the Geneva Convention to apply to terrorists because they're not official uh, actors of a uh, nation state's military and that we are willing to get involved in places to prevent the possibility of further violent action against the United States. The first target for this war on terror will be Afghanistan because Afghanistan had harbored Al-Qaeda who had perpetrated the September 11th attacks. 
So in Operation Enduring Freedom, which began in 2001, the United States with other nations uh, in, got involved in Afghanistan when the Taliban refused to turn over Osama bin Laden. By the end of 2001, airstrikes and ground fighting led by the Northern Alliance, a group of Afghanis who opposed the Taliban, had managed to overthrow the Taliban, although it survived in pockets in some regions and still survives in pockets to these days. The U.S., as of this recording in 2020, is still involved in Afghanistan today due to the difficulty of gaining full control over the nation due to a combination of topography and geography of Afghanistan and also to uh, various tribes in Afghanistan with long-standing grudges and very different definitions of what an ideal Afghanistan should look like. The second target for U.S. military intervention was Iraq. In 2003, the United States launched Operation Iraqi Freedom. The goal of Operation Iraqi Freedom was to get rid of Saddam Hussein. Now, the desire to get rid of Saddam Hussein actually predated September 11th. Colin Powell, who was Secretary of State for George W. Bush, did not agree with Bush's desire to get rid of Hussein. Remember. Colin Powell was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff during the Persian Gulf War. He believed that sending American troops in to get rid of Hussein would require too much manpower, and you also needed, it was crucial, to have a powerful coalition of nations supporting you in this action. Remember, this is Powell's idea of a post-Cold War foreign policy. You only get involved if you're part of a coalition of nation states and only with a clear exit strategy. Powell is overruled on this recommendation. In 2002, the United States announced publicly a desire for regime change in Afghanistan and alleged that Saddam Hussein possessed weapons of mass destruction. Now, there is certainly evidence that existed to suggest earlier possession and use of chemical weapons, as I mentioned in the Iraq-Iran conflict in particular. But the specific claims leveled by the Bush administration that Saddam Hussein in 2002 was still uh, holding and manufacturing weapons of mass destruction turned out to be false. Although we didn't know that when we got involved in Iraq, but later it was discovered that there were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Nevertheless, the possibility that there were weapons of mass destruction justified the invasion with this idea of uh, preemptive war. And U.S. allies that had supported the United States' war in Afghanistan refused to support the United States' involvement in Iraq with the exception of Great Britain. So in 2003, in Operation Iraqi Freedom, the government of Iraq was toppled quickly. Hussein was captured and then executed in 2006. But Iraq devolved almost immediately into sectarian violence between Sunni Muslims and Shiite Muslims. The United States is still in Iraq today, and in fact, the American involvement in the Middle East has caused a further wrinkle in Iraq with the rise of ISIS, uh, another terrorist group seeking to found an Islamic state. And in many cases, Americans have compared the United States' involvement in Afghanistan and Iraq to Vietnam. We are now entering the, we're about to enter the second decade of involvement in both places with no clear exit strategy in sight. Now, the war on terrorism, as I mentioned, is messy. Despite the Bush administration in the wake of 9-11 urging Americans against profiling Arab or Muslim Americans, many Arab and Muslim Americans found themselves targeted for violence in the United States and hate crimes. 5,000 Arab and Muslim citizens were rounded up, 1,200 were arrested and held indefinitely without charge under allegations that they 
could have information or could be supporting terrorism. Remember, according to the United States, if you're a citizen, you have the right of habeas corpus, which means you cannot be held indefinitely without a charge. You have to be formally charged with a crime or else by a certain date or else set free. The United States recognized that it was going to be very difficult to hold people on American soil on suspicion of terrorist activities. And so the United States naval base at Guantanamo Bay in Cuba became a hub for holding prisoners taken in the war on terrorism. About 700 prisoners were held in Guantanamo Bay. And Bush, uh, in executive order in November 2001, authorized using military tribunals for non-citizens accused of assisting terrorism. In invoking the military tribunal rule, this waived normal constitutional rights, like a right to a lawyer and access to evidence in your defense. Again, these are civilians being charged by military tribunals. The United States also frequently used torture to extract confessions and information from these detainees. The Justice Department had argued the Geneva Convention did not apply since individuals not part of a sovereign nation's army, that these individuals as unlawful combatants were not protected by the rules of the Geneva Convention. In 2003, torture tactics were officially prohibited, but many approved tactics used by the military and the CIA were considered effectively torture, like waterboarding. Other uh, prisons holding terror detainees like Abu Ghraib became notorious example of abuses against prisoners. We see this not only in Abu Ghraib, but also in prisons in Afghanistan, Guantanamo Bay, and in CIA secret prisons established in countries where torture was lawful. The full extent of the United States' systematic use of torture and the war on terror did not become fully clear until a Senate investigation report released publicly in 2014. This launched a debate in the public over the rights of non-citizens and enemy combatants. The Justice Department followed Bush's executive order by stating that U.S. citizens who aided in terrorism could be labeled as enemy combatants and subject to the same rules in military tribunals as non-citizens, which again would be a violation of their rights as an American citizen to things like trial by a jury of their peers, right to a lawyer, a right to evidence, and to defend yourself in court.